Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where the topic is Enterprise Resource Capacity Planning in an Adaptive Project Management World. My name is Robert Stickle, and I'm also joined by my colleagues Jim Patterson and Paul Estbrooks. During today's webinar, attendees will be on mute and I will not be open for questions. However, feel free to use the GoToWebinar question feature to submit any questions that you may have. I will address these during the webinar and will respond via email if we do not get to your specific question. If for some reason you get distracted or pulled away from the webinar, no need to worry as I'll be emailing a link to the presentation once it has been posted on our YouTube channel. I will now turn the presentation over to Jim. Thanks, Robert. Welcome, everybody. We're happy to be presenting to you again today. Uh, today's topic being enterprise resource capacity planning in an adaptive project management world. Um, we'll go in through resource management uh, and resource capacity planning concepts and how they apply in this new adaptive world that we're in. So let's get started. If we start with a kind of a 101 type of definition of what is resource management, uh, it's the efficient and effective deployment and allocation of an organization's resources when and where they are needed. You know, putting them in the right places at the right time to meet the needs of the organization and the organization's customers. The benefits of doing resource management and tackling it as a discipline is the ability to provide resource visibility to understand who's doing what and if they're on the right things. It's also to increase business value, meaning um, are we having them working on the things that generate the most value for the organization and for our customers? It also helps us save time and money when we do resource management in a more ad hoc way, uh, invariably it involves an inefficient use of resources and actually can uh, waste time and money by not having the right resources in the right places at the right time or by duplicating efforts even at times. It can also increase project success rates because if we do thoughtful application of resources in our organizations to our projects and other work, uh, the commitments that we make are more likely to be made and we get the right resources to get the jobs done well. It's also done to accommodate demand. Most organizations today get demand and request to do more projects than they could possibly ever do. And they actually have to be able to determine, do they have the resources to apply in order to successfully deliver on that demand? Or other than that, choose what things we would prioritize to work on to make sure that it's actually achievable. And ultimately, if we don't do that, we will burn out our resources and we'll put people on too many things and overreach and employee satisfaction and even turnover can result if we don't do resource management well. So what are some of the resource management challenges once you embark upon this? One is resource ownership. There's always uh, that matrix type of situation in many organizations today where you have functional organizations that own the resources, but the project management organizations or the project management disciplines that need the resources. And the question is, how do we get the right resources when they're um, uh, managed in other areas than we're responsible for or have line authority over? Another part is resource focus. Uh, we have work coming at us from all directions as contributing resources. And when I get those, how do I really know what I should be working on? Or how do I you know, limit the task switching so I don't have inefficient attention to all the things that I'm doing? Or what should I do first? What's the organization's priorities out of all the things that I get? And then there's factoring in non-project workload. You know, if we think that we're going to assign 100% of people's bandwidth to projects, it uh, obscures the fact that there's a reality of non-project workload for administrative work and meetings and other things that happen that really effectively uh, make our net bandwidth less than maybe we anticipate or that we think it is. And then how are we going to track resources? How are we going to get feedback from the resources on what they've actually accomplished and what they're working on and how much effort they've spent on things? And how are we going to get visibility across all these different things that are coming at us from different directions that you may get assigned via email or somebody sends you a spreadsheet or somebody tasks you in a variety of other work management tools that you have out there? And how do we get that common visibility to get the complete picture? And then the manual reporting, because this stuff is today in many cases siloed and separated, the mashup of that data is a very manual and time consuming process. And even when we do do it, we have too much information. We have a lot of data because resource management information tends to be very time phased granular data. And we end up sometimes with too much information, uh, too much data, I should say, and not enough useful information in a form and format we can use. So when we talk about resource management steps, 
there's different things that correlate to maybe our maturity in a resource management process or even an overall project and portfolio management process. And some of the easiest ways to do is get started with high level resource capacity planning, understanding at a kind of a headcount level or an FTE basis, who's on what projects and to what degree we assume that they're going to be on those projects. The next step might be, let's do resource allocation. Let's build detailed project plans and then assign or allocate those resources onto those uh, detailed work elements so we understand who's specifically working and responsible for what. And then on the overall resource work management side, that's where we kind of get fully functional and the resources start feeding back in the process as far as this is what I've spent time on, this is what I've accomplished, and this is the progress that I've made on those allocations. And then teamwork management is really, especially now in the more agile uh, world where we have dedicated teams necessarily that may, might work together on things uh, unilaterally, is how do we get better as a team and get more efficient and get more throughput be becoming because we become better and more efficient as a unit. And then overall personal work management, that's really the ultimate where you take the disciplines of the prior four and then you uh, achieve your own personal efficiencies to work within the context of that process to get more throughput and more quality out of the work that you're doing. Now the Gardner Group uh, has have had a variety of these things over the years, but a resource maturity, uh, resource management maturity model that was published by Gartner talks about, for example, maturity level two on a crawl stage. And if you notice in the in the uh, darker blue, the majority of what they're talking about in crawl two is that higher level resource capacity planning. Define high level project roles and staff, and then prioritize projects and programs based upon that higher level thing. It's like a sanity check. Do we in general have the right skill sets? people and numbers of people to get the jobs done. We get over to the next level of maturity in the walk stage in level three. Notice that we bring in more detailed resource allocation in that lighter blue, right? And then we refine demand requirements based, you know, that might be adjusted based upon the original assumptions having changed once we build a detailed, uh, detailed plan, uh, plan in place. And then we assign those detailed resources to the right things at the right time and, and factor in things like skills, et cetera. Other dimensions to consider in your resource management maturity is what are you ready to tackle? You know, at a capacity planning level, roles and resources might be all you want to do at first. You know, I need, you know, I need a developer, I need an engineer, I need a project manager, you know, assigned to this particular project. You know, do you want to have planning and tracking granularity that might uh, be uh, high level project level stuff? Or do you want to get down to specific level tasks? Uh, within those things and track resources at a very uh, detailed level. Do you want to have the uh, acquisition of those resources for your projects to be a negotiation process? Do you want something formalized so that there is a byplay that's planned into the process where the functional and the project managers uh, can collaborate on I, the project manager having a need and saying I need a specific type of resource to a certain degree, and then the resource management organization may be helping validate the scope or the sizing of that and then determining who is specifically going to do that. Then the governance and prioritization. How do we then rationalize or balance the demand for projects with our reality of the resources we have in place? So having a governance and a prioritization process that factors in those resource realities is something that uh, how you do that or if you do that at this point determines on how ready you are from a maturity perspective to do that. Some folks do forecasting only. They do resource management just from a look ahead perspective. They say, I just wanna know moving forward, do I have the resources to do the next things that we have on our plate? Other folks wanna capture in the actuals and basically look and see, did we spend or spend our effort and our time of our resources in the way that we thought we were going to, the way we projected or the way we assumed? And another aspect of that is to have resource costs associated with your resources, say rates, et cetera so that you can get labor budgets and tracking according to um, um, how those resources have been deployed or how they've been actually spent. So these are different things that you wanna consider and think about yourselves and what you might be ready to tackle or what you aspire to get to. So we really need to balance this top-down capacity planning at this higher level allocation and capacity plan that we talked about earlier on with the bottoms up communication and feedback eventually. And if you notice in the earlier stages of the maturity level here to the left, it's more about the top down higher level pieces because that's the easiest ones to get a handle on initially. And then ultimately when we get more detailed resource allocations and feedback, 
then the other pieces really provide that feedback to say, are we performing the way that we thought we were going to? Or are we spending resources the way we thought we were going to? And then taking that feedback to adjust our plans on a more dynamic or rolling basis. And this all comes together. The demand management and the portfolio management process really intersects and dovetails with what you do uh, with resource management. So if you look at the gray flow at the top where you get ideas and requests and you make go no go decisions to pursue them and then you build business cases and then you have a proposed portfolio of things that you'd like to do in the bottom in parallel you know you've identified the generic roles you have for higher level planning maybe determine the quantity of each role you have there identify the constraining resources and people that you have to track and make sure that you don't overburden so that you can deliver and then there's a time sequencing of when you might want to do these projects and that's when it, it really intersects with the proposed portfolio not only do we do it but when we do it and then ultimately you have to match that high level demand of projects to the supply of resources you have. And typically there's some governance or steering committee or process of folks involved in an organization that makes those determinations. And then ultimately when they determine what they wanna do, the request for the uh, actual allocation and the application of that resource happens. So if we really wanna understand simplicity resource capacity. You know, capacity in that uh, top sector is really how many people do I have that can work on projects and for how much time are they available and then what roles can they play or what skills can they apply to the process on the demand side you have to determine the resources that are required for each project what's the scope or the demand that we're going to need to fulfill that project we need to prioritize those projects that are coming in for demand and then we have to allocate resources based on role and priority till those resources are exhausted not tired but just means that they've been used up and if we do it well, on the left-hand side, we really want to develop a project uh, that's based on committed availability, meaning we don't want to plan or make commitments to anyone until we know we have the resources to get it done. And also, we don't want to start projects on the right there, it says, if resources are unavailable. So if you make a commitment and say, sure, we'll do that, and then you go, can we do this? And then the answer is no, we don't have resources to do it. We're gonna end up right from the start behind the eight ball and being able to have a less than satisfied customer, both internal or external at the end of the day. So the next steps in really figuring out where you're at is really to assess your readiness and really take baby steps. You know, understand your resource management maturity internally, understand your culture, what your culture will absorb or even allow you to get accomplished early on, or if there's certain things might take some time to uh, in, you know, introduce into the organization. And then build a resource management roadmap. And here's what we could do today versus maybe later stages where we aspire to do certain things, but have a plan for it. And develop a practical action plan to get to the next maturity level so that you can keep improving. And I would say it's usually best to define a process that you want to start with first and then automate it in a solution, as opposed to trying to automate something that doesn't exist or automate, which essentially could be vapor at that point in time. So how do resources manage, uh, organizations manage resources today? You know, many of them are doing it in Excel. And the reason they do that, and you know, I've been involved in doing that as well, it's because it's familiar, it's freely available. Uh, we all know how to use Excel. And then we're, many of us are very creative in getting it to do things that, you know, maybe it isn't the best thing for. Or we might not even be unaware of alternatives, but that's a prevalent thing out there. It's easy to start, you know, mapping out grids and headcounts and time phases and that type of thing. But there's problems with that. One is, there's lack of standards. It can be very individual in the way we model resources. It's also a very manual and static model, meaning project management is really a very fluid thing and the resource management component even more so in time phase. The ripple effect that happens because projects move and change, modeling that in a static model, cell by cell, line by line, is very hard to stay on top of. And by the time you get done modeling it, it may already be somewhat out of date. It's easy to break formulas and calculations in a spreadsheet. There's really no dynamic visibility to resource capacity to combine with that. And it's also time consuming, as I mentioned, when things change. The key thing, it's disconnected often when you do a spreadsheet from the rest of your project management information or wherever you're managing that portfolio of projects or managing the schedule. So visibility and insight to overall reporting combined of all dimensions of a project is hard to achieve when you're separating and doing just this one dimension of resource management off to the side. 
Um, just things like governance and strategic alignment of projects, it all goes to it being separate and a silo of information rather than an overall context of a solution. So more transformative options is really to have embedded processes in your resource management approach. To have a centralized data store or really a solution with a real repository on the back end of it. And also to provide visibility and reporting for actionable intelligence to tell us what's going on, what situation we're in, what's the condition of our resource plan and give us the uh, visibility we need to take corrective action while we can still achieve some type of impact. And I guess in this world, we talk about moving to more adaptive project and portfolio management. And I just want to define that real quick. It's really about the fact that we're managing an organization's many portfolios today. And the examples here might be a project portfolio, a program portfolio, an IT service portfolio, a product portfolio, all of which consume and demand resources. And to get transparency and insights for better decisions, regardless of whether you're using a variety of tools to do things to input into this process, you need an adaptive solution that'll actually bring this stuff all together as a hub and provide a single source of the truth so you can get that information you need quickly to make decisions. And then you just really, as we talk about building that plan of what you wanna do from a resource management uh, aspect, is understand where you're at in the actual transformation spectrum. You know, project traditional portfolio management on the right is there. It's still being used and folks have uh, still have application for doing that where they're using predict, uh, traditional waterfall approaches to doing projects. There's some folks all the way on the far left that are looking there to do uh, fully agile portfolio management and there may be a journey to get there. And in that you might have a mix of agile and waterfall uh, projects and using a different set of tools. And that's really what we're in that adaptive mode. And some people, most of the people we talk to are planning on being in that adaptive mode uh, ongoing because they have projects that are more suited to waterfall and some are more suited to agile and they're gonna do a combination of both. So the question is a common place where you can have a common language on what resource management means is even more important in that role today than it's ever been before. And that's where we're gonna show you one plan today. You know, we really provide the top-down portfolio management pieces of which the resource capacity planning is a key part of that. And bringing in detail from a variety of different work planning tools that might be available to feed into that portfolio and the resource dimension of that. We'll, uh, Paul will be showing you uh, visual resource capacity planning within individual projects, how we can aggregate that organization-wide to look at across all projects and all resources. What does that mean for our resource picture? being able to leverage that resource data in what if analysis for selecting our portfolio and determining when we can do projects and doing a blend of those things. And then even translating those resource allocations into financials and looking at what our labor budgets and actuals might be from a cost perspective, just on uh, from the basis of doing that resource plan. And then for being provide dynamic reporting as a natural output of the process, not cobbling this together with data, uh, manual data mashups and doing a lot of data gymnastics. The idea is to be able to have this at our fingertips and be able to produce that and make decisions. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Paul Esterbrooks and he'll give you a tour of uh, one plan and how we address the enterprise resource capacity planning in the adaptive world. Take it away, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. All right, we'll do a little, a quick demo of resource management in our one plan solution. I am gonna demo this today inside Microsoft Teams. I could, I could do this in one plan natively, I had a couple other options here, but I wanted to show it to you in the Teams environment. It's a popular uh, environment for a lot of our clients who are looking to do this there. So I'll just hide the Teams bar just so we can have a little bit more real estate and off we go. So right now I'm in the portfolio uh, view here and I'm gonna drill into that in just a second. During this demo, I'm gonna show you sort of the lens of the PM and how they define what resources they might need and then react to the schedule and the actuals as they come along. We're gonna look at it from the perspective of the resource manager, how they look at the resourcing across the whole organization and what they can do to better manage those dynamic requests and changes and pivots as things evolve. We're gonna look at it through the lens of the portfolio manager and the executive in terms of how can we use that to do the prioritization. Jim just showed that just a second ago and then some of the reporting that they can do at the tail end. So that's sort of the journey we're gonna go through today as we, as we go through this. So I'm just gonna drill into my portfolio quickly here and you can see I've got lots of different projects in here. I'm gonna to pivot to a slightly different view that I wanna just have a quick look at is my project effort summary. What I'm looking for here, kind of an executive type view is 
what's my scheduled versus uh, committed effort, remaining effort, and so forth type data. And you can see I've got some projects that are at risk because our schedule effort exceeds what we had originally planned. We've got one down here that's quite a bit offside. We might want to dig into that a little bit more. But this gives us a very quick view of where we are with these different projects and what information do we have regarding resourcing. And now I'm going to drill in. What I want to look at here for this particular VoIP phone project is, oops, sorry, jumped to a different view here. What do I need as a, as a PM to deliver this project? So here I'm going to capture my resource demand uh, in this grid. Jim talked a few minutes ago about Excel. And if you look at this UI, because Excel is so popular, because it's a grid and you can tab through and enter data directly, this UI replicates or mimics a lot of that same user experience because it is so popular. But what I'm trying to do here is capture, if we're going to do this project, let's say, let's sort of play out that scenario, what are the people and roles that I might need? And if you look at the list of resources, there's a project manager, there's some named individuals, and then there's a role called a developer. So we've sort of got a bit of both right now. We have generics that we've yet to fill or assign people to those roles, and we have people that are already on the project, potentially already logging time. Typical sort of scenario if you're planning out this project is what are the roles I know I need? Maybe there's some key individuals that I want on my project or I need because of specific skills. And then I'm going to start to work with the resource team and the resource management group around how do I fill those other roles. What I want to highlight here is Eventually, I'm going to click on the work plan and we'll see that this project just happens to be being scheduled in Project Professional or Project Desktop. But that didn't have to be the case. And it doesn't matter to me or to us in this platform what scheduling tool or, or execution tool, if you will, that you're going to use. Our objective here is to abstract you from the various tools that organizations might use, that adaptive scenario we see in every client these days, and give you the ability to articulate the resourcing requirements that you have for your project, independent of how the scheduling tool may treat that information or may treat that exercise. Project Desktop, very thorough and very deep in terms of how it can handle resource scheduling and time phasing of data and splitting tasks and weighted uh, allotment or assignment of work and all the rest of it. Project for the web, some capabilities, but not nearly as deep. Planner, none of that capability. DevOps, you can assign work to people, but it's not time phased. So those various tools, and those are just the Microsoft ones, all treat how you handle resources differently, yet all of them may be in use in your organization. So what we're showing here on the screen is I can articulate what I need and when I think I need them and to the level that I need right here on this screen, regardless of how I intend to manage the project. So I'm looking at this, I'm using my mode as hours. I could say do it in percentage or an FTE if that's how people think or that's how an organization wants to plan. Tell me how many people you need in FTEs. I personally like to use hours as works for my brain, so I'm going to stay there. I can define what range, oops, sorry, what range we're going to look at. Right now we're looking at the year of 2021. I don't have any filters on or I may want to zoom in on any of this. And right now I am comparing this to the overall capacity of the organization. So as I enter the needs for a resource, if I say I need another 80 hours of a developer there, you'll see it immediately went red because we have an over allocation of developers in that particular month. And I've just, I've immediately been told that, yes, you need time there, but that's, there's a challenge we're going to have to work through. And how we go about that, we'll talk through as we go through this demo. But what you're seeing here is just in a grid form, go in, Enter the resources. If you need to add another resource, you can add one. If you wanted to go and try and look at how we might replace that resource, so I could come down here and say, you know, find me my best match. And here's all the developers. And I could start to look at who might fill that role. Well, right off the bat, Tom, who's new to the organization, that's 100% availability. It might be a great swap out of the developer role to immediately take up that capability. And that would help us resolve some of those issues we have in terms of scheduling that resource and that role on my project. If I want to look into this, now Kono's already on the project, but I can also see here as a PM, well, what else are they on? Kono's on a couple of other projects. He is on mine, but he's on others as well. So trying to get him involved in this role, you can see it won't work because of this other particular project. So as a PM, I have that visibility into this role as well. So there's where I can do my high-level capture. While I'm here, I'll just quickly look at this and say, 
here's the actual schedule. As I mentioned a minute ago, this particular project is being managed in Project Desktop. So it has all of the rich capabilities of that tool and I can go and assign resources. You can see here, if I drill into more, you'd find the rest of them and where they've been assigned work. Now I have scheduled work. So I can draw from that particular detailed schedule, in this case, the actual scheduled work and compare that to my resource plan. And we haven't fully built out this schedule, but if I go and do my compare here, and compare scheduled and, and committed, you'll start to see where we have in where we have resources scheduled and what they actually are committed to. So here we're in balance, that's good. And if you rolled through this, you'd look for places where I said I needed them for 80 hours, but when I got to doing the schedule, maybe a couple of tasks got, del got delayed and so forth, and we're up against the deadline, the schedule now exceeds the committed. Well, that has a ramification downstream, not only in my own project, but across the organization. So we give you that capability if you're using a tool that can schedule at that level of depth or you can schedule it here. Uh, we can draw that information in and compare it to the original committed. We can also compare it all the way through to the timesheet if you want to capture data that way to now see what did I think I was going to do? What did I schedule and what actually happened? With all of that information, I can start to make better decisions around how we're going to get the rest of the project done, but also keep the organization informed regarding how resources are being used and when they will be available and keeping that up to date. So very detailed information for the PM to work with. If I jump back out to the portfolio, we have that effort view. Jim talked about port prioritization, so I'm gonna just quickly look at this. Because having captured that demand or that commitment on each and every project, I could come in here, I'm just gonna quickly sort of pull up a view. I have the ability to drag and drop projects, but what I wanna do is look at this through the lens of resources. So right now, I haven't created any scenarios, so every project is considered to be in play. We're in a sandbox right now, we're gonna do a what if. Every project's been accepted. So I could quickly say, well, obviously, some are proposed. Let's assume for a minute, I'm just gonna knock some of the ones at the bottom out for a second. Uh, just kind of work through this quickly. You'll notice down below that that's starting to kind of recalculate what's going on. Now, if I get a little more uh, surgical with my, my cuts and I start taking out some of these projects kind of middle of the pack, and I'll let that rebuild one more time, suddenly the resource plan starts to look a lot better. As I pull projects out of this particular scenario, and I could then go and say save scenario, and this is the end of April model that we looked at, you could start to see, now I didn't solve all the problems here, that wasn't my intent in the demo, but I did kind of start to look at, well, clearly we couldn't do it all. So if we start unchecking some projects and seeing what is the impact if I say, ah, let's not do that one now. I could even start to look at it and start moving projects around on the Gantt chart. Start you know, dragging and dropping projects and moving them to see if that's gonna make a difference as well to the whole calculation and move things around in that manner. So I have multiple options here for how I might balance my resource pool armed with all of that data we captured in that resource plan grid with each project that now it informs as a resource management as well as a portfolio management role, what are we to do with this? How are we going to get the work done? When are we gonna schedule it? Maybe we delay some things or maybe we defer some projects or put them on hold to focus on higher priority items based on available resources. Common requirement, we see this from all kinds of customers. So that's the, the prioritization. The resource manager role will look at this through this much broader lens. This is everything we have going on in the organization. We saw earlier that the, the developer was quite heavy, so we can start to look at this. And we've added in the capability now for them to say, well, what is the actual tasks in here that they've been assigned to? Depending on what level of depth that's been defined, we have additional information for them to say, well, wait a minute, maybe I could have someone else do that particular task that's got availability instead of who I originally planned to. So for a resource manager, it gives us this all up view of all of the different demands that are coming at us, where are people been deployed, where do we have conflicts, and starts to help us identify what options we might have. That same analysis I did earlier, the same one where I could say, let's go and look at this. I start to look at who are my options to fulfill on a specific item, I pick the item or the project or what have you, and start to look at where I might have availability to solve a particular resource constraint or, or challenge that we are facing. So rich capability to do that all up analysis, 
I don't have it enabled here in the demo, but we also have this ability to create uh, uh, negotiations, sorry, I lost the word, where a PM could then request a resource. You may have noticed in the resource plan, some of those items were planned or proposed versus committed. So they propose a resource. I'd like uh, Tom to be on my project and the resource manager could review that here and accept or reject and change that request and say, sorry, Tom's allocated to something else. You just weren't aware of it, but you can have Jack instead. And then I'm going to send that over or yes, you can and fulfill on that negotiation. Every organization has a different cadence for how they want to go about that, whether the PM can book their own resources or whether they need to make a request and a resource manager uses these views here to kind of fulfill on that and, and tell the PM or the project team, here's who's on the project. Uh, off you go and then and keep managing it and telling us how it's progressing so that we can make decisions about future work. So those are the capabilities we have there. And again, with this world of adaptive, some of these projects might be delivered using an agile methodology. Some might be done in, in a, a very simple tool like Planner or a project for the web and others may be very detailed. But at this level, we can roll that data up and make intelligent decisions around resource availability abstracted from that scheduling approach. And then lastly, just jump over quickly to the dashboards, log into Power BI real quick. And in here, we ship with this a whole host of, uh, of reports. I'm gonna jump to the resource ones for today's topic. So we have resource dashboards, so we can look at where are our resources. You can see we have some over allocated and some under allocated. I start to drill through this information. What are our resource plan details? Where are resources being allocated? Hours by department, so IT is clearly driving in this particular example and so forth. So we ship a resource, you know, report Power Pack, uh, Power BI Pack that we can then modify and extend and add additional data as organizations need to communicate and analyze and study their resourcing and look for opportunities to get more work done, looking for opportunities where they may need to add resources and optimizing their overall resource pool to drive the maximum value out of their portfolio. And with that, Jim, I'll bring the demo to a close. All right, thank you very much, Paul. Well, let's summarize all this and talk about some possible next steps you can take. So in summary, you know, we try to communicate that resource management is a critical success factor for overall PPM success, and that you should adopt an approach and processes that align with your organizational readiness and maturity. So we need to always be honest with ourselves of where we're at and where we wanna be and what we think we can sustain. High level capacity planning is a good place to start. And Paul showed you some good examples of that. Um, and then more detailed resource allocation can follow as ready or as needed. Some folks stay at that high level capacity planning ongoing and they find that to be sufficient. Um, one plan provides a great platform for all the PPM capabilities, but it has a particular strength in this resource capacity planning area. It can also extend your existing solutions to provide enhanced visual planning and capabilities because in this adaptive world, uh, we do have connectors with other tool sets that allow you to uh, bring in data from other systems. Uh, some folks were asking on the on the quick Q&A about Azure DevOps and other tools like that. Well, one plan will provide a consistent resource capacity planning mechanism and approach, regardless of what the detailed execution tool that you're using. So we have the ability to bring those things together and it can enhance in one plan, all the aspects of the top down strategic planning and analysis with the what if analysis, the resource capacity planning. But as he also showed you, Bringing in that resource allocation from the detailed schedule and be able to compare, does that detailed schedule align with our early uh, capacity planning and commitment assumptions? And one plan is fully integrated and embedded in the Microsoft Cloud. Uh, we leverage the same Active Directory authentication that you use. So once you enable it, it really becomes part of your overall user experience in the Microsoft 365 user experience. You can get started today. We do up in AppSource, Microsoft's AppSource, have a free trial available for you to sign up for. So you can go there and get a free trial uh, and play around with it. Uh, you know, there's an availability with the sample data in there, so you can have some good, robust data to get the visuals you're looking for without having to enter that data. And we also have different variations of the theme. Uh, what Paul was showing you today was our adaptive portfolio management solution, but we also have one strate strictly for strategic portfolio management people that are truly focused purely on agile portfolio management. And if you're doing billable projects to other organizations or chargebacks internally, the professional services automation 
approach to that is also available for trial. Our next webinar will be this time next Thursday. Uh, it'll be innovative financial planning in an adaptive project management world. So we're gonna take a similar approach, but really focus on what we can do and to the degree that we can track financials regarding your projects in your portfolio. Uh, so that's gonna be the topic we do next week at this time. You can always go to oneplan.ai slash webinars. And we have not only the upcoming webinars you can register for there, but also a really robust library of on-demand stuff that we've done in the past because we do these things fairly regularly. So from a next steps perspective, go out and try one plan uh, with a one plan trial. Uh, we also offer a roadmap workshop. If you're intrigued by this and you're saying, how do I get from point A to point B, from where I'm at today to what I'm doing, uh, what, what we're suggesting in the future, we're happy to have that uh, workshop with you to kind of talk about where you're at uh, what's possible and what it would take to get there from both an effort perspective and uh, a cost of licensing and that type of thing. So please take advantage of that. And if you're not ready for any of that yet, uh, we gave a very high level generalized demo today. We're happy to schedule a personalized one-on-one -on -one demo uh, with you to address your use cases, possibly the tools that you want to potentially integrate with and those types of things. So please uh, engage with us and uh, we're happy to uh, schedule that with you. So with that, we really do hope to engage with you. Um, you can reach out to us generally at contact at oneplan.ai, or if you wanna reach out to Paul or I individually, our email addresses are here. You will all be getting a copy of these slides as well as a link to a recording of the presentation today. So uh, if you would like to speak with us further, don't be shy, reach out, we're, uh, we're, we're happy to talk to you. Uh, so thank you again for your time today and have a great day.